this is kind of the uh, go to uh, uh, go to mental image of machine learning. But in fact, when we think about what happens in uh, reality, oftentimes the goal of the model isn't to label or classify or re or uh, 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 regress. It's rather to select a subset of items uh, from a large collection. So when you think about, for example, personalization, if you have, uh, say, something like, uh, uh, oops, okay, I'm trying to move some windows around. Uh, Okay, so if you have something like a personalization on your website and you have a large collection of items you might want to recommend to some, let's say, web visitor, uh, then the goal of the model is actually to se select a small set of items and maybe rank them. And that's a very different kind of problem in general, and it, it, uh, uh, it lends itself to very different challenges, both scientific and engineering-wise. So if you look at image retrieval, say in, in Pinterest, when you search for images that contain several, several gar like similar garments or similar styles, when you do face search, this is that kind of uh, machine learning application where you're searching through a very large collection of images with other images. Uh, both Google and Microsoft showed that, uh, actually wrote extensive blog posts about how the retrieval of top searches now for long questions or long form queries is uh, done better now with language models and uh, deep learning retrieval uh, solutions. Uh, and in personalization and shopping, this is very common when you're having, uh, when you're doing say uh, vacation rental recommendations on some, somewhere like Airbnb or when you're doing shopping recommendation uh, anywhere online in uh, retail, <clears throat> those are problems like that. In fact, I would argue that in terms of um, real impact on the world and how we use and consume machine learning, not as practitioners and scientists but, and engineers, but rather as, as consumers of the technology, almost always when we interact with machine learning and we, we interact with machine learning of this type. All of recommendation engines, all of visual, visual search, semantic search on, and bots now become even uh, more common. Uh, but a lot of things behind the scenes like uh, uh, fraud detection, online advertising, um, and, and so on, all work in that way. And so it's, it's an incredibly pro important problem to solve and, and help uh, companies iterate faster and, and improve on. So uh, the uh, the different problems that we talked about or the different applications that we talked about used to uh, use bespoke systems, but we see now that there is a, uh, there is a unifying uh, deep learning model that kind of, it's, not, it's, like, a, it's like an archetype of a model. It's, it isn't like a specific model, but a concept that seems to prevail in almost all applications uh, in taking a lot of these traditional applications and really transforming them to work with deep learning. And the way you do it is uh, you take your query, which could be a person in, on your visiting your website or an image or a, a, a query, a textual query or whatever it is your query is, uh, and you transform it into some dense vector or dense tensor with some deep learning model or some other embedding solution. You do the, th the same thing to your items in your catalog, again, being images or items in your shopping catalog or uh, uh, articles on, on your media website. You transform those two into images, sorry, into vectors or tensors, and then you pairwise score them using yet a third uh, deep learning network. And that gives you a score of how good this item is for this query. Now, the way you uh, select those items, the way you select what to show are just the top scoring items. So that's a very similar kind of naive uh, solution. So as an example, if I look at the big matrix of uh, many uh, queries or many uh, potential visitors to my website and many, for example, items I can uh, recommend in my shopping cart, uh, then for, you know, if I knew the score for everything in this matrix, then I could uh, easily uh, give the, the recommendations uh, uh, online, right? Um, 
And so uh, just as kind of to show you a, a few diff very different applications that work this way, if you look at early versions of image retrieval or image similarity, they went through some common uh, even pre-trained networks uh, like AlexNet or ResNet or VGG or uh, uh, Inception and there are many, many more I can, you know, there's, uh, choose your favorite and do some cosine similarity on that. That already gives you a pretty good image similarity search engine. Uh, and again, you can retrieve the top most similar images, but you can do much more and much better. You can do much better if you transform with the CNN and then do pairwise scoring as, and we see new research showing that that uh, significantly outperforms uh, naive, say embedding type solutions. Uh, the Pinterest that I showed before actually showed this is exactly what they do uh, in, you know, they published the papers showing that that's actually exactly what they do uh, on Pinterest. If you're doing semantic similarity search, uh, again, uh, it's very common to try to do something naive like transform items with some language model encoder like BERT or any bidirectional or any LSTM type model or vector and just uh, just a vector embedding type solution and do cosine similarity. Again, that already gives you some interesting semantic search. It might not be the best thing uh, just because it's not very adaptive to your data. Uh, but if you can train a pairwise score and you can adapt the transformers, you actually get top notch results and you, uh, that uh, uh, already is, is performing uh, uh, giving you actually like top-notch accuracy, not only a, a kind of variety from your, your traditional search. Uh, and again, there are many new results that show that uh, these kinds of uh, like three network solutions end up giving uh, extremely good accuracy and extremely good uh, uh, relevancy. Uh, to tie it up with a shopping recommendation, it's, you know, if you can provide a vector embedding for each item in your shopping catalog, and if you can pro create a transform solution that, that transforms a shopping cart and maybe a shopping cart plus a shopper into another vector, you can do some similarity or some dot product search uh, over that space and recommend for a shopper in real time an item from the catalog. And again, that provides uh, really good solutions uh, nowadays, much better than traditional uh, uh, tr traditional systems. I'll show something like that in, at, later. Uh, for shopping, the, like uh, we unfortunately don't have public shopping data, but you can run the same thing on something like movie recommenders for which we do have public data. And we see that the same kind of networks actually perform significantly better than uh, traditional recommendation or, or uh, traditional just simple embedding solutions. So uh, as scientists and engineers, we think to ourselves, well, we know how to train those things to get great solutions. So I'm asking the question, are we done? And obviously we're not. So if you listen to Zineb Stark, you know that, or maybe you know, regardless that uh, that's probably just the beginning of your journey, right? If you as a company are trying to onboard uh, this solution, you're actually just starting this. This is like, this is just the first baby step towards having something in production. You really have to figure out how to do training and experiments and tracking and do that in a consistent and uh, uh, reliable way. Uh, you have to create your applications to be able to instrument and give you feedback. Uh, you have to log everything correctly and, and uh, monitor that. You have to create your own data prep and feature engineering and so on. And most of all, and the, all of these are very difficult for ranking and retrieval because data is big, the, the, the signal is very sparse, but probably the hardest part of this is having a serving engine or having something in production that lets you uh, do all of this uh, at scale at, uh, in high speed because the models are very complex and the number of times you have to run them is massive and it has all, it, everything has to be done in real time. So let's just kind of dive into real-time scoring for a second uh, and see what, why that is difficult. And again, I'm focusing only on one bullet out of this entire slide. Um, so if you think about uh, a naive way to do this, 
uh, is I, I have a pairwise uh, neural net that scores how good an item is for my online shopper. And so I should just score everything in my catalog and choose the two highest ranking items, uh, highest scoring items. Well, that kind of works if you have roughly a thousand items in your catalog and you have one query per second. Uh, you know, if your model isn't too huge, you can just sweep over everything and score everything every time there's a query. Uh, not, you know, not very performant, but, but probably fine. Uh, when you have more items in your catalog, about 100,000, maybe 10 QPS, this is again a pretty small use case. You're already in some operational pain. Now you have to evaluate your model about a, a million times per second. Uh, that already doesn't cut it on a single machine and definitely not with heavy models. Now you have to start distilling and quantizing and compressing your network so they operate faster. You have to do some uh, maybe parallelization to a few machines. And now you already have this, like two different models that have to operate in lockstep and you have some, what's called, uh, you have some uh, information loss or you have some recall loss between one step and the other because the distilled model could have potentially pruned away a good solution for uh, one of the top scoring items. Uh, well, that doesn't quite cut it after you grow more. If you have about 10 million items and about 100 QPS, now we're talking about some actual like uh, service in production. Again, not, uh, not Google or Microsoft scale, but definitely at the retailer scale. Now you're already using uh, even farther and more efficient pruning. And now you have to create these embeddings and maybe nearest neighbor search or something else that prunes away even more aggressively and more upfront before you, you, you create your, you hit it with your distilled model. And you have further recall loss on that step. And further, you have uh, uh, you now have to cr basically create three different machine learning solutions that all work in lockstep for this to be useful. And when you grow even more, even that doesn't cut it anymore. So now when you, you're really at the billion, or it actually happens in the hundreds of millions already, and maybe even uh, at lower QPS than 1,000, but just to keep the numbers round, here we're looking at a trillion model valuations per second, uh, at least theoretically, if you did it brute force, which of course you can't. Uh, and so here, even nearest neighbor solutions kind of uh, uh, can't really work anymore. Uh, and you'll go, you're going into hardcore pruning or hard like database search engine type pruning where you're basically like filtering on shopping, uh, categories or by some geo or some time span or something, uh, some, some uh, hard rule that already prunes away good chunks of your search space. Uh, needless to say, that has a lot of recall loss. So now you really are upfront uh, giving up a lot of great candidates just because you really are, uh, you just can't handle the, the, the load. Um, and so uh, this was literally just like one step out of this entire slide where when you're growing and scaling your application in production as a company, you might be almost excited or uh, at least uh, cautiously excited about building great models, but very few companies that I'm uh, working with and talking with are very excited about building these like massively distributed systems and being uh, and wanting to support them in production. So uh, we we still have as a community a lot to uh, improve and and uh, deliver on. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about this at, at Hypercube. So we've assembled an uh, an incredibly talented set of people, uh, and what we wanted to see is how can we improve this and make this journey significantly simpler, easier, and better for companies uh, all around. And we, we went back to the basics and we said, wait a second, let's look at real-time surfing, which we identified as, as a real problem, right? Uh, and see how simple can we make this? What is, what is, if I could just wave a wand and make all the problems go away and make the simplest possible solution, how would that look like to the customer? And what we came up with was basically, I as a customer don't want to do any of the building. I don't want to do any of the, the fancy systems work. 
Uh, and I don't want to really know too much about how to prune or do any of those things. I really want to create a pairwise scoring function uh, that tells me how good one query is for one search result. And that's it. That's all I want to do. And I want everything else to be done for me. And I want it to scale and be performant. Uh, and so uh, in the beginning, I thought that would be impossible. But we kept thinking about it. We kept experimenting with different solutions. And uh, we now have something that actually does, uh, does it in a significantly better way than uh, the way it was done before. Because now instead of pruning bottom up with different rules, we actually create the entire step stack top down. And from the pairwise rule, we can actually infer how to prune things more efficiently, how to accelerate the retrieval of actual top scoring results and so on. So a lot of different parts in the stack had to be reinvented and re-implemented. But we know now that we can actually increase recall and increase the quality of the returned results uh, based on the pairwise scoring and building on our stack. And for the vast majority of applications, we can actually improve performance as well in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, SLAs for search, for uh, retrieval, so better throughput, lower latency, right? Um, uh, not only that, because we do everything in an automated way and we actually learn everything, uh, uh, the system actually learns how to optimally serve those models. If it actually created a much simpler solution as well. So if we try to create this like BERT you know, transform text with birth and then search through it, then uh, you get a much, uh, uh, then you can do this now on Hypercube with literally this code. So I, I sweep under the rug uh, with this like load function. I sweep under the rug uh, some, you know, loading of the XML of, you know, the, the Wikipedia dump and parsing it, all sorts of nonsense that has, uh, well, it's significant in terms, in the sense that it's important to get to right. Okay, so if you're trying to do this on uh, with Hypercube now, uh, now, then what you will do is literally create a collection of documents. Uh, up, I mean, with our client, so you instantiate the client, you create a collection that already shuffles the data and serializes it and, and puts it on your service, uh, re remote distributed service. It already, uh, you create an index for it, which would now do all the transformations, pack everything into uh, efficient retrievals, prune everything, understand how to work with your uh, data and understand how to serve it in, uh, quickly. And then you create an endpoint, which gives you a fully distributed, uh, region replicated, fault tolerant, you know, uh, elastic uh, framework, uh, uh, environment where you can now, uh, uh, you can now run queries against. And so you can now run queries directly by importing the client from anywhere. This could be in the same notebook or anywhere else in the world uh, and literally hitting this endpoint with, with, uh, with uh, queries and getting back the top results. So this is literally the entire code needed for, for that, which you can, uh, you can uh, understand is obviously significantly simpler than the year, you know, at least a year of development that you would need to go through before. Uh, we recently published a paper with Home Depot. We actually didn't publish it, it was just approved for publication. It was uh, accepted for Rexis 2020, uh, where we took their uh, shopping recommendation model, which is, is very, it's a very heavy and complex model that they trained in house. Um, and uh, showed how to, you know, th the paper actually goes through mostly about how to train it and what uh, they have gone through creating it, but also how we went together uh, to production, how we got it uh, uh, to be customer facing and, and showing uh, actual results on the, on the Home Depot website, which already gives uh, now like increased uh, conversion rate and uh, revenue per recommendation is significant uh, boost. So that was that was a big achievement both for them and, and of course uh, for us and we were very happy for them. Uh, and so the key takeaways are really that uh, data, uh, deep learning is really unifying a lot of different problems and a lot of different domains, specifically in retrieval and search and ranking. Uh, those uh, 
present really hard conceptual and engineering questions uh, that we are working on solving and making some headway on. There is still a ton to be understood and built and created. We are not nearly done, uh, but we've made some progress and we're very excited about it. Music